Thomas, welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks for having me, my friend. So you're the founder of Solaris, which has the mission of building a campus to help technologists find and build their life's work, if I got that right. Yes, sir. So I've been seeing this all over Twitter, probably more than almost any other community or, or project like it in SF. Where is it at right now? Where is it at right now? Well, in the last few years, we've been really focused on just creating somewhat of a scene in, in Hayes Valley. Right now we have seven neighboring apartments. So lots of people all living up and down one block. People commonly think it's like a hacker house, but in reality, it's just lots of different smaller apartments all next to each other that are all highly connected. We have a office that we're moving from right now. So a 4,000 square foot space, that was once called Newton. We're migrating to a 21,000 square foot space called Solaris AI. And we also have a directory called Directory SF. It helps people in the tech scene find housing in San Francisco. The, the cool thing about directory, and I think I was telling you this earlier, is I've seen a lot of these like websites to find roommates in SF pop up. But every time I like go and try to find who's behind it, it's like some kid that just graduated out of college and has like six followers on Twitter and he's trying to build the site so he can find someone himself. Yeah. And so when I saw you post it, I was like, oh, someone from like the inside basically is kind of posting it. How's that doing now? Yeah. And so it's, it's funny you say that because the reason why I actually started Directory SF and the reason why I shipped it was because everyone would hit me up all the time for housing. So they would like, all these people would text me, put me in group chats, DM chats, all this stuff. And it's just like, Hey, like, what are like the open houses? Is there any houses in Solaris? Is there any like on your, on your street or is there any co-living houses that you know about? And I would just get all this inbound, like, day in and day out. Like I would show you now, like maybe five a day at one point. And I was just getting to a point where I'm like, man, like I just can't help anybody. Like this is just completely useless. Like I would just stop responding. <laughs> um, and so I was like, you know, maybe I could just like direct the momentum to something that would solve the coordination problem without me. And so we were actually setting up the very first office, which was, you know, Newton about a year ago. And so while we were setting it up and all the construction was happening, I decided to just get back in the code, ship something really quick, took me maybe a week. And then I was like, all right, like I'm just gonna put this site out there. I'm like gonna spend absolutely no time you know, doing it once I ship it. And then once people hit me up for housing, I'm just gonna direct them to this site. And so, you know, what eventually ended up happening was like, I would still get the same amount of inbound, five, 10 people, some, you know, five, 10 people a day hit me up like, hey, I'm looking for housing. Yeah, just go to this website, you'll mm. find it there. And like at the very beginning, it's kind of funny. Like, you know, if you're working on a startup full time, you're like, how do I solve this cold start problem? I really didn't give a shit if it would get solved or not. I was like, I'm just going to send people here and like let people coordinate themselves. Like, and it worked. It, yeah. um, it worked. It was just because, you know, the, you know, you're starting something and it's just like an idea and you don't have much of the network. You know, it's, you have to solve that cold start problem. But if you're getting five, 10 people hitting you up per day, eventually everyone shares it around and from there. Feels like such a foreign concept to me because I remember it was 2021. It was like my first time kind of like properly being in the tech scene in SF. I was with Sigil, uh, Sigil when now he's working on air chat. Um, back then he was working on this thing called Monument and we were talking about like potentially having me on as a co-founder. And so he was like, come hang out with me for a day. I'll show you what SF is like. And so we go to, I think it was called Genesis. Yep. And then we go to a bunch of like, it was called the neighborhood. Uh, or it was called Solaris. I don't know which one it was, but he explained the concept to me as like, yeah, so basically a bunch of people come if they're working on a startup and they all live together. Yep. And for me, the only concept of like roommates that I had had was like college. I was like, people like have roommates like after college from like a work perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was like the most interesting concept. And then now I see it like three or four years later and it's like the most normal thing I'll, I'll find people that like just they'll come to the effing office and they'll be like, oh, I just moved here a week ago. I'll ask them where they're living. They mentioned Solaris. And it's kind of like grown into much more than just housing. What was the first like year of actually getting that concept off the ground like? Yeah. So initially a few years ago, I raised some money for this thing called Together Casa. And in a nutshell, I was like, you know, building this kind of like marketplace for people to find co-living houses, like Airbnb for co-living. And the premise was simple, three-sided marketplace to help people, you know, find a house, join a house uh, and start a house. And so it's like, you know, if we can connect homeowners with people that want to start a house, with people that want to join a house all together in one place, it'll be super simple to get them off the ground. Uh, we did that for approximately, you know, a year or so. We started like 15 houses. Have you heard of Edify? 
Yes, actually. I don't know why. So um, it was like Ben Laufer and Luke Piet, and they they were like one of the first people we worked with. So they were like a together Casa house. Oh, nice. And so like Luke. we, what's that? I know Luke very well, yeah. You know Luke very well? Yeah. yeah. So we worked with them. We got, we, you know, we got the, you know, whole Edify thing set up and running and it was great. Um, and it seemed like we were able to do a really good job at filling these houses up. And eventually we just kind of got to a point where it was like, at least the way that I was seeing it is like I set out when I first started working on Together Casa with one simple mission, create a fundamentally better way to live that's going to last many generations. And I found this co-living thing, this like almost like boutique niche thing that people love to do for like a few months and then like never do it again. And I was like, I don't want to do that. And so, you know, we could have continued to like scale it up and bring more people in but I, I kind of just got to a place where it's like, I just don't think this is going to go where I want it to go because people care about two things equally, privacy and community. And privacy actually maybe a little bit more. And so when you end up living with a lot of people for a long period of time, the kitchen gets dirty. Uh, you know, Avi made that comment about the pizza sauce. You know, <laughs> it, it's, uh, you know, you have little things like this that add up over time and, you know, living with 20 people in one house, it doesn't work out. And so a lot of people were just kind of like done with it after three months. And I just kind of saw that happening over and over again. I'm like, okay, there's not really potential for like a massive growth engineer. So I kind of shut that down. And in the process of figuring out what's next, I was like, I still am like very focused on this mission of like, how can we help the average person ascend Maslow's hierarchy of needs? So going from this like very primitive version of society that we're in today, where everything in our immediate environment is designed for access to things or like resources for our day-to-day -day life, like food, water, shelter, housing, et cetera. Like if you were to walk down the street anywhere in San Francisco, the way that we interact with real estate or businesses around us is you pull out a place to work, you go to a place to eat, uh, and like maybe some entertainment. And like, that's your environment. And the thing that I really like about college that's so different than this, you know, normal way of living in a city is that the spaces that you have on a campus are designed to help you find your purpose. 100%. They're designed to aid you and bring you down this journey of figuring out what it is that you wanna do with your life, or at least in theory. Most colleges don't actually do that. They just kind of like, you know, push you in and through, but you get this very meaningful experience. And so I came back to San Francisco and I want to create that. I want to turn, I want to tran you know, transform the way that we interact with our lived environment outside of our immediate house into a place where you have lots of different spaces that serve a very niche need on like the higher orders of uh, meaning in your life. So, you know, you know, forget kind of like the physiological needs and like the safety needs on, you know, the Maslow's pyramid. How do we get more people to feel belonging? How do we get more people to feel this degree of esteem and eventually self-actualize? And most people that come to San Francisco come for one reason. You come here to find and build your life's work. You know, people come from all over the place because you want to start a great company. You want to build something amazing. And so the way I see it is like San Francisco has parts of this. It has all the resources to build an amazing company all across the city, but it's not well coordinated. You know, if you want to feel like you're in the scene or you've arrived to Silicon Valley, quote unquote, you go to a meetup. And when you're in that meetup, you feel like you're in a room of people that you understand. And when you leave that meetup, you're entering the streets of San Francisco. And that's a completely different world. And the way I think about it is imagine if we put Twitter in one square mile. And like the feeling that you leave your house and you're immediately immersed in this environment where you know lots of different people, you know your neighbors, you know the people around you, and they're all mutually interested in the same thing. They're interested in finding and build, finding and or building their life's work. In this case, it's a technology company here in the city. And so when I moved back here, I was like, okay, I wanna do this. And so I set up these neighboring apartments um, called Solaris and started off with three. And it was a whole kind of assortment of, you know, AI founders, researchers, et cetera. And we kind of moved into these different houses, didn't want to do a co-living house because I know they didn't work from the previous thing. Uh, but what we did was we put these August locks, you know, these like digital locks where you right. could like scan with your phone and go between the different houses. And each house had a different purpose. Mine had a kitchen for hosting events. Another one had a sauna. So you could go in and sauna, you go inside that house That's and you fire. run into people. Um, and then another one has like a backyard for hosting events and whatnot. Nice. And it created this dynamic where you would just like bump into people. Oh yeah, then my house also had like a co-working space in the beginning. So a lot of people would come to my place to work. 
And then eventually we hosted these dinners every week and it grew and grew and grew and everyone started inviting their neighbors uh, or friends to live nearby. The Slack kind of grew and it became this thing where about 30, 40, 50 of us all kind of moved on the same block. And that's kind of really how Solaris got started and the direction that we're going is like, we can get this density of people all in one area and continue to serve these people's needs and, and continue to build institutions within walking distance of each other, more and more people will move into the same geographical area. But um, it started off with just getting people to live on the same block. That's so interesting. Have you, fe- do you feel like now you're at the point where, you know, you mentioned what if you put all of Twitter into like one square mile? Yeah. Where are you now in that journey or like in that, if that's like the scale? Yeah. So where I'm at now is I stopped focusing on this like linear progression of like, how can I continue to coordinate a lot of people to live on the same block? And mainly it just, because I I didn't, I I found that it was like really hard to manage like a smaller community. Like there's different sizes and scales to this, but I was like, I don't want to focus on just like one block anymore. It's like, how can I like pull the lever to help more people do this? Um, And so I, the next thing I did was like, I want to open up an office that supports lots of different people. Um, And then if we open up this office, people will live around it uh, because that's where they're going to work and you choose to live where, near where you work. And so, you know, I was kind of thinking to myself like, well, you know, maybe we can, instead of having like maybe 30, 40 people, I open up an office and it supports a hundred people, you know, and they have friends that live with them, et cetera. It'll get a lot of people to kind of like live in the area. So we opened up uh, a place called Newton. Uh, it's an office for AI startups. We right. launched that approximately a year ago and it, started to do very well. Lots of people started working out of the space and we designed the space for two core tenants, focus and being around other people also building AI companies. So that way it's like you're in focus mode. And then the second you leave, you can bump into somebody that's also interested in working on the same thing as you and you know share value resources, et cetera. So that started to do very well, get more people to live in like the Twitter in a square mile. Uh, and then the next thing that kind of took off was uh, this thing called Directory SF. And Directory SF is just, you know, an app, a housing directory to help people find housing within you know, the square mile. And with Newton, one thing that's interesting is you guys launched, there was this video um, and it went super viral. You had a lot of people that are well known in the SF space. I remember you had Mickey, you had Sejal, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you might have had Avi in it. Um, and suddenly I felt like everyone I knew either worked out of this office or it worked out of Newton's office. Sure. You had Rahul, you had like basically everyone. Yep. How did it become feasible for you to actually make that work? Were you taking equity in these companies or like, did you have someone like kind of like funding the the office or how did you make it work? Uh, we charge for office space. Got it. So we, we charge for office space. Everyone pays and we're making more than we're spending. What were some of like the best things that came out of it? Because like if you ask anyone downstairs here, it's like some story of they met someone that turned into their co-founder or they met someone that was an investor or they became very close friends with someone. Someone plays a show and everyone goes to it after work. Yeah. What are some of the things that kind of happened out, out of Newton? Uh, the first one was right when we launched, Avi dropped tab there. That was a pretty big day. I remember that. Yeah. So like Avi, Avi like released tab in the space and you know, it was funny cause Avi initially came up with the idea of tab with myself and my co-founder, uh, Jacob, you know, we were all sitting on the couch and Avi was trying to figure out what's, you know, what to do next. And he kind of shared his idea for tab and we all just like jammed on it for a super long time. And so it was kind of funny cause it was just me and Avi working in the space for a very long time when it was under construction he and then to see room. it. The day we launched, boom, you know, share it and the spot and like the whole thing ended up happening. And that was like a first, like very big moment. And it was like, wow, like this was incredible. Um, yeah, that, that was like the first kind of like big thing that ended up happening there. Um, more recently, you know, two people that we really believe in, they found each other as co-founders in the space. They were both working on like tangentially related projects and they both decided that it'd be better to work together and pursue what they're working on now. Um, can't go too much into what they're up to. They're still kind of like stealthish. Sure. Um, but you know, that was I'm like, they're a very promising group of guys and I'm, I'm expecting big things coming from them very soon. That's so interesting. Do you feel like there were any drawbacks that came from putting so many smart people together in one room, specifically related to like the social dynamic? No, like we, we did a re- like I am a, very, very, very functional designer. And so I think about every square inch and how exactly we can set up the space to deliver on one core thing, which is focus. 
And so like when we set up the environment, like you could walk into Newton or like the main aisle and hear a pin drop dead silent. And so nobody's talking to each other. Everyone's locked. And so like locked in all day, every day, you had like offices going down the center. So it's like this big open room. You have offices going on each side and then you have a handful of desks in the center. Quiet, dead quiet. There's no interaction. You know, the, my fundamental belief with when we set up Newton is very simple. It's like 99% of the time you gotta be focused. 99% of the time you gotta be building and shipping product. And then we will create opportunities for you to get to know other people in the space outside of work hours. So we hosted events and have done other things like that. But there's not much like, I would say that like people know each other and they're friends and they help one another. But I would say it's not like very social. It's not, it's not very social. And so I don't think there's a lot of opportunity for that to happen. That's interesting. Where does your understanding of like what a startup needs to work come from? Like what were you doing before you started doing all of like the co-living stuff? Um, yeah, so I, I, was, uh, I, I was the founding product designer at Fast. Really? What yeah. was that like? It was interesting. It was, interesting it was, how? It was, it, was, it was extremely interesting. Um, you know, when I got to the company, I was very, I was very grateful. I just moved to San Francisco and Rick Burton, I'm sure you, sure you the know goat. Rick. The yeah, goat. He's the goat. You know, he, he got to like, you know, like, you know, I like corresponded back and forth on Twitter and he like really wanted to help me get a job. And at the time I was like doing some design work and trying to figure out where it is I wanted to land. And, you know, I was chatting with Coinbase and Twitter and fast. And it seemed like fast was like, you know, they just raised some money from like Patrick Collison and Stripe or like, it was like low key at the time. It wasn't public yet. And like the founder was like selling me on this. Like, My God, that guy is so charismatic. Like <laughs> he's like the most charismatic salesman I've ever met in my for life. For better or for worse. <laughs> like uh, all I can say is like, there's still nobody I've ever met in my life that can sell as well as this man. No way. Like he is just incredible at sales, top point oh 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 one percent at sales. Like, like it's like so much so that like, you feel like you're in a reality distortion field around this guy. <laughs> and uh, you know, the thing was, is that I think a lot of people at the company, um, you know, really kind of like fed into that. And I think, that, you know, very early on when I was working there, I had some, quarrels with the founder, just like very di strong differences in philosophy, um, clash heads with the guy a few times on like my disagreements in the product direction. Um, and eventually I got to a place where I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to leave this company. Um, but you know, I would say like overall grateful that he gave me the experience to work there. And I got to see what a startup that like did something, I guess for a while worked <laughs> something. out, um, something. And, uh, yeah, I, but I would say I would say overall the company was a crazy shit show. <laughs> One question I have: you hear a lot of people talk about kind of how you just described the founder. They yeah. describe these people who create like word for word a reality distortion field around them. Yeah, or they're like insanely good at selling, or they have this crazy vision that everyone buys into. Yeah, the way I picture it, it's like okay, you can sell someone for a day, you can sell someone for a week, mm -hmm. but at what point does like the sales tactics start to wear off? Like what was the day-to-day -day actually like? I would say I was enchanted by this guy for like maybe a solid month. Okay. Um, and I think a lot of people were enchanted by him through and through, like went the entire length of the company with him. If you really had to think about it, cause you've spent a lot of time with a lot of people now, like vetting people, what yeah. do you think it was about him that made him so good at selling? He just could redirect any, like he was really good at redirecting. Um, Interesting. So like, for example, if you were to like talk about a claim or like refute a claim, he would just like charismatically switch the topic onto something tangentially related without refuting the claim that you made <laughs> and make you forget about the claim you're making. Very, very politician like, very politician like, but like I could just watch him in a room with people. I, I was fortunate able to see him talk to people that he was trying to hire, people that he was trying to sell. And like the energy he was just throwing at the person was like on the next level, just like so much energy, so much zest for what he's doing. And like, there was, there was just about anything you could throw at this man, regardless of whether or not it's fully true uh, or, you know, fully addressing the point, he's redirecting it into something that's making you forget about it. And he will make you forget about it. And like, that's the crazy part. Like it, it took me a few times of that happening where I'm like, wait, like, wait, you know, like one click checkout, but then like people are like clicking that button over and over again. And like, they're buying a lot of shit. 
this is not a good idea. We, we should do two clicks. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. One click, that's the vision. And like, <laughs> that always, was- That's the vision. That's the vision, mate. He was like this Australian <laughs> guy. And uh, it's the vision, mate. And uh, there's one click and you're done. And- uh, Just like that. Just like that. <laughs> and, and I was just like, you know, I'm like, all right. And then like, you know, everyone around me be like, yeah, all right. It's like one click and you're done. And then eventually- That was I the whole just, point of the company. That's the whole point of the company. Yeah. And I was just like, I was like, I was like, I really think it should be two clicks. Um, and you know, it ended up leading to this kind of like whole situation, but, uh, now there's really, no really, really funny overall, really funny overall. Did you take anything from that experience that you can see tactically being implemented in Solaris? Um, he's like, I try to do everything the exact opposite way. <laughs> no, I, I think again, like I don't have all bad things to say about that experience. Again, like he's extremely charismatic he is the, again, I still stand by this. Like, I think if he had a good operations person or a technical leader that he trusted, like actually trusted hundred percent, I think that company would have worked. Really? Um, yeah, because again, like one to build the, it, issue one to sell is, it. the issue is the fact that like, so like he's onboarding all these companies, lots of sales being done, but then they're churning, lots of churn. And so like it's a leaky bucket problem. Mm -hmm. He's bringing them all in and then they churn. And so like, he's doing a great job of bringing them in, uh, but they're churning. And so I think that like, Again, I think amazing salesman. I think I, I learned a lot just by like watching him operate from just like sales in general and like the energy he brought to a room of people. I think he was incredible at that. Um, but yeah, I would say in terms of like learning lessons and like how to operate in a way that like works better. I think like operating with integrity is very important. And I 100%. think that like really being honest with yourself on what's working and what's not and like looking at the actual reality of the situation is super important. Um, and I think that was like a core issue there. Was, I just don't think that like the, the reality of what's happening in the company was prioritized. And so like, I, I, I try to always make sure like, I put something out there, is it actually working? What's not working? And like, be genuinely curious about figuring out what about it is and isn't working. Do you find yourself constantly having to sell the vision of Solaris to people? Or is it something that like instantly resonates with whoever it needs to resonate with? It resonates pretty strongly. It, it, it resonates pretty strongly. But again, I'm not over indexing on sales as much. Um, the thing that I'm like really focused on is just like creating these few things that are creating these flywheels to just naturally get people to move. If I was to say, hey, listen, there's this beautiful vision of community and something like Adam Newman. meme of the world if this didn't exist. Yeah, it's like, I'm gonna sell community and community and community. And like, it's very vapious and it doesn't have any tangible substance behind it. Uh, then yeah, I would have to lean on selling a vision because there's nothing there. But yeah. like, if you focus tactically on like creating things that are just selling themselves, it's not really hard to sell. It's just like, go to this and it'll do its thing. So there was a period of time in between, or basically almost right before effing, I was working on a company, we called it Tivity. The idea was Airbnb for coworking. Sure. Coming out of COVID, a lot of companies had space that they had nothing to do with. Sure. And so we were like, the same way someone can Airbnb their house out, what if companies could Airbnb parts of their office to turn into coworking spaces? Sure. From doing this, I got very deep into the Adam Newman rabbit hole. There was probably like a six, like a, a six month period of time where I probably knew more about him than people that actually worked at WeWork because I read every book. I watched every interview. I remember there was like a 14 hour flight from SFO to Dubai. The yeah. entire time I got, I read two books and like, this is, doesn't really count, but I like binged We Crashed. Um, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I read all the articles, every smear piece, every like, this is guy is the greatest person in the world yep. piece. And I see a lot of, from a vision perspective, not a day perspective, similarities in like some of the stuff he has tried to do, elevating the world's consciousness, but like tactically we work and like whatever the new thing that he's raising money for, I think it's called flow is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you take from like what he built? So, okay. Adam Newman, I think fundamentally the issue, I, I've read a lot about him too, um, naturally. And I think the fundamental issue with this man's entire approach is that like, again, he wasn't in contact with reality. I think that, you know, he was very sipping his own Kool-Aid on the vision of community. And everyone but, around him. What? And everyone around him too. And yeah, everyone, everyone around him. But like at the end of the day, he was selling a commodity workspace. And the reason why it only was workspace and nothing more is because he wasn't in service to a group of people that shared 
a way of life. What he was doing was just saying, I want to take the, in the same tech fashion, I want to scale office space and sell individual seats. And in order to scale it up the way that he did and the fashion that he did, you have to do that. The thing is, is that he really fell for the trap of thinking that it was more than it actually was, which was just office space. And I think that the way, if you actually want to do something a lot more similar to this like highly connected way of life, you have to inspect the word community. What is a community? Like, why do people get in communities in the first place? Well, the reason why tribes form is because the sum of its parts is better than any individual unit because you're trying to do something. A community is a group of people that do a thing together. And that thing ha is the purpose. In the case of early tribes, it's like, where you're going to survive together. So you are going to hunt, you are going to gather, you are going to do this, I'm going to do that. And together, we are going to have this little atomic unit where we're able to fend off enemies and gather food, resources, et cetera. And if you have that purpose, that underlying connective tissue, then what ends up happening is you get a group of people that, are, that actually feel connected to one another. And I think in the case of WeWork, that, that wasn't it. It's just like, I'm coming in, man. Like, I just want a fucking place to work. Like, that's it. Um, whereas I think the way that I think about things is I am building, like, very intentionally, not trying to scale up Solaris AI, I'm not trying to scale up Directory SF. These are things that I do not want to make for millions of people. These are things that today I want to be extremely good at servicing a very niche group of people, San, people in San Francisco tech people. And each one of these things are specifically designed for that small group of people. And when you do a good job at that, what you end up finding is you're building something for a group of people rather than this like general scale to everything massive situation. So in the case of Solaris AI, what is that thing? Well, everyone is working on an AI company. And so when you go into an office and you're sitting down, you're working, you're focused, when you bump into somebody else in the space, they are thinking about working on, collaborating with, and getting money from the exact same people. And so what is everyone's purpose? It's individual, but it's collective. Individually, I'm trying to raise money right now. I'm trying to build my company. And another person's trying to do the exact same thing. Oh, I know this investor I just got money from, and you are looking for money right now. Introduction, because I believe in you. And then it goes around like that, where it's like there's actually a reason for you to know and want to know the people around you, because they could literally help you. And then again, collectively, you're all trying to work on and with an AI, but that connective point of I'm trying to build a AI company and everyone else is doing the same thing is the purpose that causes a quote community to form where you can help one another to do that. In this case, build a company. Um, and I think that's like very important in community building is like, what is the thing that the community is surrounded by? And you can always find it. I, I'm like a firm believer that you can always find it. There's no reason why two people would spend a lot of time together or a group of people would spend a lot of time together if there wasn't something they were mutually benefiting each other with. There's just no example of that otherwise. So then is your goal with this that if you think about like impact at scale, it's that the output from putting these smart people together in a very concentrated room mm -hmm. or a very, a very concentrated place, the impact from that is something that reaches the world? Or do you ever plan to like, okay, now we figured out SF, let's yeah. think about New York tactically. Let's think about Miami tactically. Let's think yep. about Dubai. You know yeah, yeah, saying? yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a good meme about this. It's like in, in the future, <laughs> it was like something along the lines of like, post AGI men will work on two things, like societal primitives and how we're gonna get to Mars or like how we're gonna like go throughout the galaxy. And like, there's a lot of, there's, there's some truth to that. Like, I think the societal primitives is going to become very important. And so like, would I want to take what we're doing with Solaris outside of San Francisco? Absolutely. The question is like the, the zero to one, so to say, is like, how can we create a place within a city where you live and you're around next to hundreds, thousands of people that you know and want to know within one 15 minute walk? And if you can do that in one city, the question then becomes like, how do you do that in other cities? Like, is it like similar to building a tech company where you just take the exact same stuff and apply it there? Probably not. What probably is, is you go to a different city, you find the leaders of that scene, you open source the playbook, you get them to do it, and then you fund all of the real estate. Um, and like, they're the ones that are like leading the scene. They're the ones that are running it. But again, like when you're trying to start these things off, there's not really a good way to fund it. And so helping them get started and off the ground, probably the way to go. Um, 
But again, I'm not even really sure. But the number one thing is like today, make San Francisco work, do a really good job at helping people like myself, you know, get their core mission done, which is find and build your life's work and then go elsewhere. And it feels like you guys have done a really good job of building an ecosystem. How many people are on the team for you to be able to tackle living and work and like the real estate, like office management, real like property management side of things, like all at once? Yeah, so I mean, right now, I would say the number one thing that all of our resources are in right now is uh, Solaris AI. Um, Solaris AI, the new office space that we're opening up, all of our resources are put there. Directory SF is on autopilot. Um, like that's on autopilot. Like I tweet about it every once in a while, but like the great thing about it is it does a great job at helping people self-coordinate. Um, I worked on it with someone else named Neil Seth. He occasionally maintains it still. Um, you know, like ship some updates, you know, on the, on the app. Um, very great guy, very, very fortunate to have him. Uh, but the core team of Solaris right now is essentially four people. Myself, my co-founder, Jacob Schamberger, uh, Austin, who is our videographer. Austin, yeah. And then uh, someone else named Flynn, who's kind of like doing office management and stuff like that. And then like an assortment of contractors and things of that nature. Uh, but yeah. I'm curious to know what the contractors look like. Not like, you know, it doesn't have to be their names and what their roles are, but like sure. if you had to divide it by percentages of like, you know, this is like marketing or like what actually goes into like the larger, what are the smaller pieces that go into actually building out Solaris? Yeah. So, I mean, with the new office building right now, we had two amazing, you know, interior designer architects, Isabel Orsi, who did uh oh, no space. Way. Yeah. 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 She, she helped out and set everything up for, for Solaris AI. And we have this other guy named David Duane, who is in Cal Newport's deep work. Um, and you know, he had this idea of eudaimonia machine, like how can you set up an office space perfectly for focus and creative flow in the same place? So he kind of came and advised us. Um, and then we just have like lots of individual, like when I say contractors, I mean like literally like they're building furniture <laughs> and like moving stuff from place to place. We have a lot of people like that. Uh, but yeah, like that's, that's it. So it's interesting. You mentioned deep work. That was one of the books that I read probably like 14, 15 that actively, changed probably the outcome of my life if I hadn't read it. What from working with him have you learned about how to set up your office so that it's like the perfect place for like flow state? Sure. I will honestly say that this new office was 100% designed, set up, run, led by my co-founder, Jacob. Jacob Schamberger, he did everything. Um, you know, he's the one that kind of set this up and running like I zero to one Newton, the previous office space. Uh, but like he led the whole project. He kind of got everything running with that. Um, honestly, I saw it for the first time. I didn't even set it up. Um, I saw it for the first time on, on Monday, but, um, yeah, no, like he was one that worked with David and, and everything like that. So I'm actually, I can't really even answer that question. I respect that. Um, but then how do you let go of things? Cause I feel like, you know, this is something you've been working on for years. One thing yeah. a lot of founders kind of have trouble doing, and you mentioned this with fast is they have trouble like working with someone that they trust enough to give them the space they need to succeed. Mm -hmm. You ever feel like you have problems with that? For sure. <laughs> Jacob, the thing is Jacob is the most competent person I've ever met in my life. That's a big, um, big thing to say. He's extremely someone. competent. There's like, he, he, he and I dropped out of college together. No way. Um, so we went to college together. Uh, we worked on like a, little startup crypto thing many years ago. Um, but he was my co-founder for that. We like stopped working together for a while. Like he moved to LA, I you know, did some other things. And then we got back together for doing this. But like, I trust the man with my life. Like there's uh, like this guy, like he is insanely good at what he does. Uh, I could literally know that if I put him into the most fucked up situation, he will make it out better than 99.99999% of people in any situation. So like this weekend, I was pretty anxious still that I like, I want to see what's going on. Cause like, you know, same, same kind of like anxiety, right. but I knew in the back of my head that like he's running it, it's fine. That's solid. I feel like most people will never experience that in their life. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm very blessed that I can, I can feel that. That's fire, dude. And what is your guys' like, five, 10 year plan then if you guys are, it sounds like you've been working on this together for a really long time. Jacob actually came on to the team uh, earlier this year. No and way. so like he came on earlier this year and started working with me, but you know, I've been doing this kind of like heads down for four years, but he, he recently joined me. What is that process like? I feel like you've more recently, I've seen a lot of my friends who have been building a thing since college specifically, they're three or four years deep. They meet the exact right person that like would 10 X the thing and mm -hmm. they bring them on as a co-founder. 
but there naturally will just be that like initial mismatch because one of you worked on it for a bunch of years and the other one didn't. Yeah. What were some of the things you had to get through when you were initially bringing him on? Nothing. Nothing. No. He's my best friend. Like he's my best friend. Like, yeah, I worked on it for like three years, three and a half years before he got involved. But the thing is, is that those three, three and a half years is me turning the cube, figuring out how this thing is going to start to work. It's been like a lot of false starts, like lots of false starts. And the way I see it is that he is going to work with me from now until when it's big. And like these like last three years is like, this is not big at all. It's nothing. It's obscure. And so the way I see it is I'm pricing the value of him into what we are going to make this together when it's actually huge, rather than looking at me figuring it out by myself and like it not working out. Um, and so I don't see this, I don't see this as a situation where like, I'm like, oh, well, because I've been working on this for three years, like, you know, like I'm not going to be equal with you or I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to like share the upside with you. Like, no, he and I are 50, 50 on this 50, 50. Damn. That's yeah. big. That's really big. There is no one that I'm more certain of in my life than that man. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't even know what to ask after that. That's crazy. <laughs> well, you know, again, I, I'd say a lot of great things kind of coming together right now, just overall, like, you know, he and I have, we're, we're, we're taking this to the next level. We're continuing to bring more people in, more founders to the space. We're going to be getting more into directory SF later this year, once the office kind of gets more on autopilot. And then, um, yeah, like got this like city campus project also, also in the works. What is the city campus project? Is there, what can we, what can I, I, I publicly know? Yeah. Yeah. So city campus right now is kind of like underway to being launched. Um, you know, we're going to go forward with the project and like it's overall, you know, kind of aims in like the next two weeks or so. But like, I think at a very high level, I, I moved to the city and as I had this vision for like building this kind of like place for technologists to find and build their life's work, there was a few other people that were working on similar stuff, but like maybe not as tech focused. Um, so Jason Ben, who founded The Neighborhood, you mentioned that earlier. Um, and then Patricia Mo and Adim Alamed, they founded The Commons. Uh, they are also all within like the same general vicinity of like where Genesis once was. And, you know, they've been kind of like running and operating and helping people find housing and stuff in that area. Um, but like Jason took like a really keen interest on like families and, and co-housing. Um, he's written a lot about communities. I respect a lot of what he's talked about. And then Patricia and Adi, you know, have thought a lot about wellness and meaning and, you know, your sense of self and curiosity. And they, manifested that into the commons. And all of us kind of had this like multi-generational undertone to like what it is that we wanted to do. And so I kind of saw it as like this like very synergistic situation where we could, you know, build a campus, you know, build a place for, you know, kind of like build a campus, help people kind of feel that, you know, same sense that you would on like friends, uh, you know, where, you know, on friends, you know, like Chandler, like runs up next door and like bumps into the house and, you know, you're inside hanging out with people just like that. Like, that's kind of like the vibe that we're going for. And like, we, we want to create this like 15 minute city, you know, where like everything you need and everyone you love is within that 15 minute walk. And I think like focus on, you know, creating like the more spiritual, like loving connection stuff is very important. Like it can't all be just about building tech companies. Uh, you know, it also needs to be heavily about like the things that are going to make people feel happy and connected to their, uh, to their environment. And they do a really good job at that. But like, yeah, city campus really in, in a nutshell is just like a, that 15 minute walkable city where everyone you know and everyone you love is within that 15 minute walk. And there's places for you to find and pursue your life's work, live next to amazing friends, easily raise a family with other people that are doing the same thing um, and so on and so forth. And, and like, that's kind of like the, the project. That's sweet, dude. I'm going to ask you the question that I ask everyone kind of before I wrap things up. If we were going to do this podcast again in exactly a year, what are the things you've wanted to accomplish so that you would consider the past year a success? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would say that in the next year, if I was to look back on this and be like, what would this next, like, what would be a success from this next year? I would say that Solaris AI goes from just the top two floors of this 20,000 square foot space into the bottom two as well, 40,000. Uh, lots of people have started new companies just from the sheer proximity of meeting people from the space. 
uh, Directory SF is monetized and helping not just hundreds of people find housing, but thousands of people find housing within this one square mile. Um, and the the city campus having a very successful launch going forward and um, supporting lots of people that want to open up spaces within the square mile and then work those spaces working out. Uh, and then finally figuring out a, a, a deeper pathway to uh, long-term value creation. I think that we'll make good money, decent money on the office building and we'll make decent money on directory SF, but it's not going to be anything that's like outsized. And I think that over the next year, figuring out the key to what's going to generate outsized returns. Um, so that way we can do a lot more of this is where I'm anchoring a lot of my attention to figure out. Damn dude. I'm gonna see you in a year. Yeah. See you in a year.